All right, so uh, hold on, I'll get this video going. Can you see my screen, guys? Yes, we see Miro. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so this uh, conference is also some sort of experiment for me. I haven't been participating too much in these, those kind of virtual um, conferences, so I wasn't sure what to expect. So in case you want to join me on the Miro board, you can do so, and you can also just you know leave a sticker note here while you attend the session. And you can also just follow along on the mirror board, or you can follow along uh, just watching the video in Zoom. So, yeah, I just start uh, with that presentation so we can get going. So uh, before we start, I also wanted to say that uh, <laughs> I've been lurking into the community for a long while, and I'm really happy and appreciated to, to also, yeah, be able to contribute today a bit. And today I want to talk about uh, versioning design systems and some lessons I have learned. And yeah, we will go through the talk and hopefully we will have a discussion. What are your learnings and what are you struggling with uh, afterwards or even beyond that um, conference? So let's get going. Um, just a quick introduction to who I am. So I'm Yola, I'm a UX design consultant. And I'm helping companies build successful products across functional teams, usually by reconciling Scrum and UX. A lot of companies still struggle with that. Once they get started with uh, Scrum, they don't really know what to build for their uh, users, as you might know. And I also have an alter ego. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I'm calling it the UX Einhorn. So this is the German word for UX Unicorn. And it's wonderful because it helps me to raise the UX maturity in companies that I consult. And it keeps me sane when I build design systems and I get, it gets my creative juices flowing uh, when I'm hacking Figma. But more on that later on in the second talk today. Okay, so now that we got this out of the way, uh, I would like to introduce or reiterate why versioning really makes sense to think about and get started with. So before we get into versioning, I think we really have to face the ugly truth. And this is our components in our design systems have a life cycle. Yeah? So at some point, a component starts its journey. Maybe it first enters or becomes you know, a reality inside of a backlog as a ticket. We want to do it. We want to make it. Then our work as designers starts. We conceptualize what this component is supposed to solve for, how this should work or could work. Then we you know, pair up with development, the technical implementation starts. And from there in the happy path scenario, yeah, it becomes available. Uh, sometimes we have to iterate, we have to go through rounds and loops, but that's just the way it is. That's the nature of things. And yeah, once a component is available, mm, at some point, yeah, it's not enough, or we have to somehow iterate it a bit more. So it gets back to the backlog, you improve it, you create another variation, you add some functionality, and it becomes available sort of again. And this can continue for quite a while. And maybe at some point, it will just become deprecated. And then basically, its life cycle will end. So this is the reality that we're facing on the one hand side, and we need to be aware of. The other thing that I would argue that we need to be aware of that we sometimes are very poor in terms of our communication. And what do I mean by that? So my experience is that a lot of designers are poor communicating what's going on with their components. Yeah? Usually when the component goes through those life cycle changes, at some point, what we communicate is, hey, we got something new that is available. Let's say, uh, I don't know a modal dialogue or something. And you can see your representation of a file. And this is usually the world that we're concerned with. This is some design tool. We have a new thing, a shiny thing, and we ask our developers to integrate that. So they go ahead and give us a thumbs up. Awesome, that's cool, we needed that. Let's go and code this into our product. So they start to put this into products and different places. So then again, you remember the life cycle, yeah? some changes need to be done or we believe we need to do some some changes to the component so there comes a time when we communicate again hey developer i made some changes 
So the developer starts to think, huh, okay, what does this, what does this mean? Uh, can I just pick it up and integrate it into my code base or will something break? I'm always concerned when I have changes, something could break. I don't know. So they get a bit nervous. Uh, but we just leave it at that most of the time and they have to figure it out themselves and then weird communication can kick off from here. And it gets really weird if maybe there's a third uh, iteration and you made even some more changes and they've been going on about their business and they've been integrating this thing into more and more and more places. And then they will also start to think about, oh my God, those upgrade costs are going to kill me. Uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't wanna integrate any more of your stuff. And, and this is a very dangerous situation because then UX can somehow turn into not you know, being perceived as beneficial to the product, to the user, to everything, but rather it will flip on the head and people will not like to work with you anymore. And we have to be aware of that. And this is all, it comes down to communication. So how can versioning help us here? So to get started, I would definitely recommend you guys, and this is a straightforward recommendation to use semantic versioning. So a little explanation about why to get started with this, because it allows you to communicate much better. Yeah? And also your stakeholders, especially developers, are very, very used to communicating with semantic versioning. So semantic versioning basically is a, some sort of uh, syntax, I would call it, where you have uh, mostly three numbers that are divided with a dot. And the first number, we're calling it the major, the second is the minor and the third is the patch. So each number has some semantic, as the word suggests, meaning. Yeah? So major numbers go up for incompatible changes. So this helps you in communicating. So whenever something breaks, you have to upgrade that number. Minor changes, uh, which could be like new features that are sort of backwards compatible, will increase the minor number. Patch numbers, on the other hand, are really just fixes if something is somewhat off yeah, and it's not working correctly, but are, when fixed, still backwards compatible. And just to give you a few more examples on what are breaking changes or what could be breaking changes when we're thinking about design systems. So obviously technical stuff like API changes, for example, when you have to somehow, for some reason, create the model dialogue in a different way. Uh, from a code perspective. This could mean a breaking change. But also be really, you have to be um, aware of that also visual stuff can definitely be a breaking change. Let's say you're moving to brutalism or whatever it's called, the next trend where you have this huge headlines. Yeah? Obviously this will have an impact on spacing and also could move stuff out of the viewport or whatever. And if this is somewhat also breaking the user experience and what they're used to, to getting from your app, consider this also a breaking change. Another one that's pretty obvious is that if a pattern changes, let's say you used to have a button load more and now you want to use a new pattern like scroll to reload or scroll for more, then this could also mean it's a breaking change. So, when you start to think about it this way and communicating it um, with the semantic versioning, and then, yeah, you have a better chance of not confusing your stakeholders, but rather getting agreement and alignment with those as well. So, like I said, it becomes easier to communicate with devs. It also becomes easier to plan ahead. And it also helps us to communicate and to collaborate as designers together, because we can always rely on talking do we use or have you been using the same set of tools in order to achieve your um, solution or do we need to really introduce something new? Uh, and this is really enriching your communication um, among each other. So what else to consider when you want to get started? So what to version is also a question that comes up a lot of times. So when you think about your component uh, library, uh, then you could go with the approach of versioning the library as it is like as a whole to the left you can see that or you can also um, version each component inside of that library both have their benefits and, and and cons i'd say so a lot of times um the approach to the right the feature-based approach is really good if you're 
technological stack is some sort of relying, let's say, on web components where each component is somehow uh, contained in itself. So this has the benefit of you could match and mix components with different versions, whereas the uh, global version tag really applies one version to all its components. And this is just like almost like a monolithical approach, which ensures that this state is within itself. It's, it's definitely consistent. Personally, but this is just my opinion, I somehow find it easier to think about that left side approach, but I'm also curious to hear about your uh, learnings and, and, and your preferences. Um, all right, so uh, just keep it in mind that you have to make this decision at some point. Now, what's also important to note here is that whenever you get started or you don't have any versioning going on, you pretty much can consider yourself that you are living here. You're sort of pre 1.0 or I would recommend you to somehow think about it this way. And this is nice because this is like being in a, um, it's nice in a sense that at this point you really are still in a, what's the right word I'm looking for? A Sandkasten, it's like a safe environment, yeah? It's a sandbox basically because this is definitely considered as not totally stable across the board and stuff can change and break, it's not a problem. But once you have a state or a situation where you say, okay, this collection of components and patterns is really consistent and works together really well. So then you're in a situation where you are basically introducing your first major. So that's the 1.0.0 in this case. But this changes also how you will be perceived by your stakeholders, developers, and so on, because now you have to somehow be committed, yeah, because they will expect certain things from you. That's, for example, yeah, once there is a one in front of it, this is considered to be stable. And you're supposed to also help them out if they're bugs. And you are definitely supposed to fix those bugs, but in a way that's not breaking the whole thing again, right? And you can be quite a while in that state. And then your minor changes go up when you add stuff that sort of plays along very well with the other stuff. But at some point, like I said previously or earlier, you will encounter a situation where you want to introduce a new major update. And then basically you're in that rhythm and that loop uh, of yeah, versioning your design system. A couple of more words about the topic of planning. So this is just a screenshot from uh, Jira. So I encourage you guys also to find a way to really manage the stuff that gets, you know, uh, into your design systems if you're not doing it already. And so what you're seeing here are those versions because that software uh, allows you to somehow create buckets of tickets of stuff that belong to a version. And it helps because yeah, you can then start to think about which topics do we want to have in that next version. You can then assign t-shirt shapes. You can do the regular things you can do when planning. But it, it definitely helps to yeah, look a, a few steps forward to decide when we want to do this, what kind of change will this be? Uh, will this be a breaking change or can we just add this to the stuff that we have already? And this way you will have a much more refined communication, internal communication in the design system team, but also it will get you in the situation and the position to also communicate much easier with your stakeholders and uh, consumers of the design system, basically the users of your design system, right? So this is really helping you out a lot in um, planning as well. All right, now that we talked about getting started, I'd like to talk a bit more in depth about how to align this stuff because there are a couple of moving parts in a design system, I would argue. So the challenge here is somewhat that you have a code side of things um, and you have probably a design tool and you have maybe design tokens that we've also learned about in this conference uh, as well. And you have the documentation side of things. My recommendation of how to align stuff is to think about it this way, that for me, most of the time, I consider the documentation to be some sort of the 
single source of truth regarding the version, like the version of the system and its parts that belong to it. And how do we reflect that? Because usually the people will first go into uh, your documentation wherever uh, it may live. And over there, you can definitely manage a change lock where you communicate your overall version. And now in this place, it's a good idea to list the dependencies. So the overall version of a system could be like 2.0 and now the system consists of a framework so this is part of the code and it consists of a certain version of the library which might be the theme as well as some adoption to the components within it and it might also consist of a yeah a team library in your design tool and it also consists of design tokens which live in a separate uh, ideally in a separate repository as we've also seen previously and now it, it, it really I guess helps in communicating what's going on because you will a lot of times have a situation where you might want to introduce a new component. So obviously this means or relies on changes to the library. That's why you need to somehow connect it and tie it back into this change log. Then there probably are from time to time some improvements you want to communicate. So let's say you just add a couple of more do's and don'ts for a text field usage. So those could be purely like in the documentation th side of things. And yeah, you want to highlight those, but then again, how would you version this if not here? Yeah, so this version really relies on the documentation itself. Sometimes, and you will see this, and I definitely have learned that this is working pretty well, is that you don't always need to do changes on the code side of things when you want to refine, let's say some guidelines, it just, yeah, you, know, you just need to update your documentation. So with separating those concerns and having a dedicated version for your documentation, that really, uh, I'd say, is almost like an umbrella for all the other moving parts below it, you are able to do this in a, in a way that's manageable. And here, just as an example, maybe you will also want to uh, communicate some bug fixes to some core component, which you somehow get out of the framework right out of, out of the box. So usually staying in Zync is, is a lot of work, but it's worthwhile doing it because it eliminates confusion and more communication that then just happens later on and gets people really upset. So I encourage you guys to really start doing this in, in, in a more sophisticated way. It's also important to note that when you talk about those moving parts and what needs to be aligned, uh, the details usually still depends. It really depends how to go about this. And I will show you an example today of uh, a certain combination of those tools because it really comes down to what type of tools do you use. And this somewhat also dictates how to go about versioning. So obviously there are many tools for coding or languages and frameworks. We also see an increasing amount of tooling around documentation, design systems, uh, design tokens and design tools also usually get more instead of less, which is good for our community. But in the end, this results in there isn't a silver bullet solution to versioning, I'd say. You really have to adapt it to your own needs and your own set of tooling. So, but I want to give you an example today. So today's example is based on Confluence as a documentation tool. And this is from a project that also Sylvia and I were working on and the design tool Figma and for design tokens, style dictionary, uh, Amazon uh, open source project. So how does this play out? Like I said, the documentation and its change log is some sort of the umbrella change log or version. So you can see here, this is just a uh, screenshot from, from the change log of the documentation. And as we saw earlier, you will see the docs version on top. You will see its dependencies, in this case, whatever framework and code side of things this was relying on. In this situation, we were still building our team design tool component with sketch. So some sketch library is reflected here. And 
yeah, then again, you will also be able to really document what updates are included in this version. And you can, you know, point out new components and changes and improvements. <clears throat> also important to note that on your documentation side of things, you might also want to add more information on each component. So on the component level, in our case, in the documentation, we did also uh, document since when this component is part of the design system and its latest version, and as well as its life cycle state. But this is a bit specific to us using Confluence as a documentation tool. It's not that easy to somewhat um, version the whole collection of um, lousily coupled uh, confluence pages under one real version. So it takes some sort of manual effort to do so. Hence, uh, we decided to go about it this way. So we don't also have to manually update all those tags. It's just a, a way that worked for us to also reduce just maintenance of all these tags and stuff like that. But it's also worth to mention that it, since we are uh, using this type of tooling, we also decided to not always reintroduce a new page in Confluence for every little change in the component. So this is just some text out of the documentation of a specific component. And we just refined some behavior description in the documentation. So we just added it in a, in a we wrapped it in a container just to highlight what changed. Uh, partially. If we have a lot of changes going on on one page in the documentation, we will replace that whole page and just keep one earlier version as a sub page available for a certain amount of time, a couple of months, and then we will somehow drop it at some point. It's also important to note that you should always be concerned about when stuff gets deprecated and you have to absolutely have to communicate this again on the component level. So it's also important to um, ensure that you have planned for some migration time. So it's not just important to communicate when something will become or is has become deprecated. Usually you also want to ensure that um, there's an alternative available to use right so people not just get aware of that this is going to go away at some point but rather what should they use instead going forward and i think we will talk about this uh, special topic uh, in the end of this talk once more but it's a good practice to definitely highlight out those things in the documentation and at the bottom of each page of each component, we even have a separate change log just for that component. So you see the evolution, what happened to this component. So this is helpful because when you go to that component and you somehow see, hey, something changed. I don't know, I don't recall it this way. You can just go to the bottom and you will have your history of that specific component. And we decided to go about it this way, not, not have it any other place because obviously the umbrella version of that whole documentation and its change log didn't seem the right place to do it. So we decided to, to document this on a component level side of things. All right, so let's switch gears into design tool. So I mentioned how to stay in sync or in line from the documentation towards your design tool. You have to add it as a dependency, I'd say. So in this case, our example is Figma. So what you're seeing here are those covers that you can use. So when you browse your Figma project, uh, each component is managed in its own file and each file has a cover, some sort of a thumbnail, if you wanna say so. So we're reflecting the version of the component over here. That's the first yeah, place where you will encounter the version tag. Then again, when you open up a component, in this case, like I said, we're using Figma. So you have a couple of uh, places where you can communicate your version tag. So in Figma, you have uh, the option to, to put it in a, in a field called description. This is available for those new uh, shiny and fancy uh, variants that they've introduced, but uh, you can also 
add this to a regular component. And this is uh, really going a long way. And you will see this in a bit of how to keep your stuff aligned. Also, what you can do is you can definitely use the link to documentations and add a link that ties back to the Confluence side of things in this example, in this specific situation. So what does this give you? The cool thing about it is designers really, when they hover over your team uh, library and want to use some sort of component, the tooltip pops up, first of all, with the name again, and then again, you will see that version tag. So you're pretty sure, okay, this is the component with that version. Now you can yeah, be pretty confident about what is available and what I can use. On the other hand, when you build your stuff with that and you somewhat hand it over, and I don't like to use that word, I prefer you do the handshake with the developers. So they will start looking into your designs and they will select some, something here. They have the inspector to the right. And when they click on a tool, uh, on, on, on a component, they will see exactly which component you've used, which version is used. They might even see its configuration, but this is also specific to, to Figma, keep that in mind. And okay, they can also click the big button, view documentation, which will take them back to um, Confluence where you will see more guidance about how to use it, but also code examples. <clears throat> this way, you're not you know, worried about them using the wrong version or they're getting confused which version to use. It's all aligned. It's really helping you in this scenario. All right, let me just see, did I move to the right? <laughs> um, to the right. Yeah, okay, that's a bit of a weird transition, but it's correct. Now that we covered um, documentation and design tooling, just one more note about design tokens. So as we've also seen earlier, um, it's really beneficial to keep those in a separate repository, um, as Lucas also pointed out. So we're also doing the same. This is a style dictionary uh, repository. It's just a screenshot of that, in this case, GitHub repository, and we're using tags as well. So this is also great because whenever I ask for uh, a developer to you know, reintroduce or to introduce a new component, I can also tell them, look, in order for you to create that component, I've been uh, putting together a couple of tokens for your component and they're included in version, whatever, 2.7, because it's a, new feed, it's a new component. So we might need new tokens. And he then exactly knows what to build upon or what to integrate when he's about to uh, start coding. So this is really enriching your conversation also with them. All right, so a couple of more uh, sentences about communication and adoption, and then we can jump into questions and answers. So since we decided on going with semantic versions, um, you can really start to have a better communication going on internally and also externally. So when you consider like your versions that you can see up over here as dots uh, over a, a timeline, Black dots are major, the, the, oh, I didn't match the colors, so sorry for that. Those are supposed to be minor updates and those are supposed to be patches. So usually you, over the time, uh, you do changes to your system. And on the one hand, yeah, this allows you to communicate key changes and key moments in the evolution of your design system much more clearly with your stakeholders. And usually we do this by having some sort of release communication. So a couple of, so on, on the bottom is supposed to be external communication, whereas here we have some sort of internal communication. So external communication towards our stakeholders. So yes, first of all, <laughs> like when a release date or deadline that we set ourselves that we want to, to to release something new is coming closer and closer, we will start to communicate this look guys, we're about to re release a new version. And just to remind you, it will include one, two, three new components and those changes. So it's also definitely worthwhile to 
over communicate this so they're aware that there is a change coming and then you can also definitely celebrate your release with a nice email uh, and um, send it out to all your stakeholders and consumers of the system once really you, you press that release button and, and it goes out to the wild. And the other thing is that when you think about this as a cycle, you will then see some patterns. So usually about two weeks before we're planning to release the new version, next version workshops start. So first an internal small workshop within the design system team starts and gets kicked off. And we know more or less what are our stakeholders waiting for. So we can plan for which components to include in the next uh, release. Then a couple of days later, we will uh, double check with our um, stakeholders if nothing from their end has changed. We will then even include them in a final workshop that we all together uh, somewhat agree upon the next release candidate. And this kicks off the next cycle. And yeah, obviously, there are other ways and, and, and channels to continue the conversation, like instant messaging channels where people can post bugs if they find uh, something or they have a question about, I don't understand that guideline, we have a special channel for that as well, so we can follow up. Um, and usually also mm, internally, yeah, the design system team and its designers who are then are part of a product team also use here this time frame to really get in sync so we know what's going on and what's at, what they can use basically. So one more slide about the topic of adoption. So in this project or in this example, we sat down with some uh, people who have a saying about software architecture and we did agree upon an approach that basically, so there's a contract that says whenever uh, a major release from the design system is being published, there is a time box of three months to uh, migrate to that um, version. And we're only supporting one version below the major version. So one previous major version. And after we have a third major version, yeah, the, the, the oldest one gets some, it doesn't get any support anymore. Yeah? And in this case, um, we do also, have some sort of communication going on that really allows an adoption as early as possible. So even if parts of a new version have been published, we encourage teams also what, with every minor change and update to immediately start integrating and using those components. So your design depths uh, and technical depths don't pile up too high. And this model has worked fine in this project so far. And yeah, uh, I think it's important to over communicate this, especially in the beginning to find some, some sort of agreement, working agreement or a contract, if you want to call it that way, how you want to work together, some working agreements. And then obviously I can just encourage you as always in agile uh, ways of working, inspect and adapt, see what's working well, and then talk about it and find new ways to cope with it. All right, so more or less half an hour. <laughs> I tried to stay in that uh, time frame, and yeah, I definitely uh, I'll be happy to 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 learn more about your experiences and questions. <laughs>